What's up, man? It's your big brother, K. Reno. I want to shout out to my homie, Kofi, from Kofi's Universe. Y'all make sure to subscribe to his channel and support everything he got going on because he be dropping that knowledge. Yeah! YouTube salute! King Kofi is back once again. Man, we have a special guest on my channel. This rapper MC gets requested all the time by so many subscribers on my channel. And I see the comment section, how much they talk about his lyrical wordplay, um, his creativity, people from Hungary, South Africa, South Korea, Honduras, Barbados, um, Guatemala, Peru, many countries. We can go on and on and on. This guy is a member of Demigods. He's a member of AOTP. He stands on his own as an MC slash producer. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, friends and enemies, the one and only Apathy. Peace, peace. What up? Peace, How man. You doing, Thank you man? for having me. Appreciate it, man. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. It's just a blessing in the skies to be living, especially in this time of, um, you know, the pandemic we in, but I'm still, I'm just thankful to have my health and my family. Right, right. Agreed. hundred percent. That's right. That's right. Um, before we get started, just want to say um, thank you for once again, coming on to the channel to do the interview because so many people, they love you on my channel. The people that actually never even heard of you that started to listen to you, they're, they're loving your music. That's dope, man. I really appreciate it. I wanted to come on sooner, man, but as you know, I took on uh, a new hat, real estate, you know, so that that ate up a lot of my time. So, but I, I made it a point where I wanted to link up with you, you know? Well, thank you. And I appreciate that. And um, congratulations on, a, on another endeavor in your life, which is, is it going great? You like it so far? Yeah, it's incredible, man. It's absolutely incredible. I love it. I'm inspired. I'm happy about it. I, I feel motivated and, and excited. So it's fire. I love it. I really love it. Okay, cool, cool, cool. One of the first questions I was going to ask you is, you was born and raised in Connecticut, correct? Correct, yep. Okay, how was that, you know, your, your, your life experience? Because I really don't hear too many people talk about Connecticut. So I want to get it from your viewpoint. Connecticut is, is directly in the middle of Boston and New York. And Connecticut is a strange place because there's a lot of uh, rural towns, but there's also a lot of cities here, too. you got New Britain, you got New Haven, Hartford, you know, you got Waterbury, all these. I could name a hundred of them. But there's all these different towns. And Connecticut was created with a lot of um, textile mills as its infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And uh, once those mills went out of business, it, it left the state pretty economically destitute. So Connecticut is a place where there's a lot of people who are middle class. There's some people who have a lot, a lot of money closer to New York in certain areas like Greenwich and all those areas. But most of the state is, is very blue collar and, you know, sometimes uh, really economically destitute and, and don't have a lot of money. So growing up in Connecticut, it's a very strange dynamic. You know, I, I once had a line where I said, I'm from places where blacks live a block from the racist. You could go from hood to woods at 20 paces. And, you know, that's pretty accurate. There's places that are super, you know, um, hood grimy neighborhoods. And shortly down the road, it'll be like a nice, uh, you know, wooded forest or some shit like that. So um, it's, it's a real strange dynamic the way Connecticut is set up. But it, it definitely feels very... New England, very East Coast. And, you know, if you watch any movies like um, th that are like similar to Boston movies like Mystic River or The Town, a lot of those have the same feel. Rhode Island kind of feels the same. Connecticut kind of feels the same. And a lot of Massachusetts feels the same, you know. OK, so are you a big Boston Celtics, um, New England Patriots fan? <laughs> I, I grew up with my uncle loving the Boston, Celt Boston Celtics and I love, you know, Larry Bird and Reggie Lewis and, and, and D Brown and, and a lot of Kevin McHale, Robert Parrish. So I love a lot of the, I really love the Celtics, but I can't act like I'm the biggest Celtics fan. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I never really had the time to follow sports. As soon as I got into music, that was it, you know, and I became obsessed with hip hop. Like some people are obsessed with sports. And, uh, but I, I do, if I root for somebody, I definitely root for the Celtics. If I root for someone in baseball, it's the Yankees. And then historically, my uncle, my father, my grandfather all loved the Dallas Cowboys. So um, that's a, a strange dynamic of, of up here. <laughs> a lot of Cowboys fans in the area. 
<laughs> that is strange, but but it's all right. good though. Um, speaking of um rapping, what made you start rapping? Uh, I mean, this goes back to the eighties mm. when I I think the first maybe. The first record I can remember, I don't know what I first audibly heard, but the first record that I remember was Shaka Khan's I Feel For You with Melly Mel on the um, on rapping, on doing the rap in the beginning. And I was just open. I, I forget how old I was at the time, um, but I was little. I was like four or five, and I just wouldn't stop saying it all around the house. And then after a while... I would make up my own words just because, you know, I got tired of saying the same thing. So I would do the same flow that he did. Um, but I would uh, change the words, you know, I'd rap about lunch and my toys and all that. And then my uncle got into breakdancing. He was, my uncle was B-boy and he had the cardboard out and he was breakdancing and, you know, he was, uh, really, really big into, he had 45s, like he had the Paul Revere 45 later. He had run DMC, um, a lot of hip hop. And then my father, would stay up with me late at night and, and record um, hip-hop shows from the local college radio station. We had a DJ in Connecticut named Doc Nine, who was pretty much like our Mr. Magic, our version of Mr. Magic. And so, you know, I remember being so little that I had no frame of reference to the world. So at one point in time, I went to my uncle's high school to, to watch a, a high school band perform. So when I was sitting in my house and I heard Dougie Fresh and Slick Rick the show, my brain, because it didn't have any worldly view so whatsoever because I was so little, I thought that Slick Rick and Dougie Fresh were at my uncle's high school. That's what I pictured in my head. I thought it was like a, like a telecast or something of, uh, you know, a radio cast of, uh, of, of my uncle's high school. So I'm sitting there listening on the radio and in my head, I'm imagining them on the stage in my uncle's high school gym rocking. But I, so I was like, holy shit, you know, I'm hearing the show and I'm hearing all these records and it, it just had me open. But my father would stay up with me as late as I could possibly stay up. Then I'd go to sleep and my father would stay up and sit by the radio and flip the tape and, and put all these rap joints on tape for me. And then I'd listen the next day and I just listened all the time and I, I, I got really into hip hop and then I became obsessed. And my father was always there to, to really facilitate that. Um, years and years later, uh, in my teen years, I had a radio show at a, a local college radio station at the University of Connecticut. My father would drive me to that, pick me up. You know, it didn't matter if it was a blizzard. He would go out and just, you know, he would he would buy me tapes all the time. So that was, he was a big facilitator of, you know, my mom too. My mom would buy, but my mom got pissed one time that uh, she found out I had an NWA tape. <laughs> and uh, my dad bought it for me. And so he, he he gets off the phone with her. I didn't hear them. And they were they were separated at this point. And he gets off the phone and he takes the cassette tape and he puts it down on the table and he goes, he looks at me and goes, bam! And it smashed and it broke. And I was like, what the fuck? And he goes, he leans forward to me and he goes, I don't care if you have this tape. I just don't want to hear your mother's mouth about it. And that was it. And so from, from that point on, if I bought tapes, I would show my mom and I'd put my thumb over the parental advisory and I'd be like, yeah, it's all good, blah, blah, blah. You know, and I mean, at the end of the day, later on, they didn't give a fuck once the initial shock was over of, of that. But uh, that was that was some shit that I remember, you know. But that was a lot of my introduction to hip hop. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you for um, sharing that with us. We, I appreciate that. I know everybody else appreciate that so much. What... Or who are some of your favorite, like, heroes besides, I mean, uh, your dad, your mom, anybody else that's probably, like, growing up that's influenced you to be where you at right now as a person today? Right. Right. You mean you mean as far as, uh, so besides, you know, uh, whoever, you mean uh, as far as, like, um, rap, like hip-hop? It can be, it can be hip-hop. It can be, you know, family. It can be maybe, like, a neighbor. It can be maybe, like, somebody you read about. You know, when you was in school, you know, just a book you picked right. up. Right. Right. I had my uncle Jeff was really, really huge in my life. He's he was 12 years older than me. He, you know, he's like my big brother. I used to come home from school and we would hurry up so we could catch G.I. Joe's and He-Man on TV. And you know, he was he was he was a ball buster, man. He was a tough guy. They would fuck with me and you know, and and you know, just like um, treated me like a little brother, like him and his friend Rich. They would, you know, fucking diss me and make fun of me. 
And uh, but it was a good dynamic. You know what I'm saying? It was like the type of shit that gives you character. It wasn't like fucking cruel. It was like a, like a dickhead older brother to yeah. have. You know? And he's really funny, too. And, and, and they would always bring me around and do shit. And, uh, you know, my uncle would sit there and let me play all his 45s and hang out and and do all that. And I go through his room and I thought he was cool as fuck, you know. And so my uncle was a huge influence on me. Later on, um, the radio DJs who looked out for me, my man, um, Uncle Chocolate was um, a DJ who had a radio show. He's actually the reason how I got into radio. He was this dude who went to high school with my uncles and my my father. And uh, he ended up helping me out uh, tremendously, getting me up to the radio station. And, and then, you know, I met uh, a lot of my mentors, DJ Boogie, uh, Rockman Abdullah, and uh, my man DJ Zop. And those guys were like heroes to me, man. They, they kind of, once again, I, I think paying dues along the way, um, it's important to be it's important to remain to to maintain humility with people who check you and 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 there's there's a a totem pole situation as far as seniority goes and those people who are your ogs and they check you you know what i'm saying because they always kept me on the humble they taught me very important lessons and and they were they were they would be assholes to me and dicks to me here and there but it was out of love and it, it taught me a lot you know what i'm saying that's why there's so many suckers now because they don't they don't get og lessons you know they don't they don't get taught a certain way they just feel entitled to results and they feel entitled to respect respect has to be earned and dues have to be paid so those those guys were the men who were very important to me i also I, with with certain jobs that I had, um, like I, I had this job at this place called Caruso Music, and uh, these two brothers, Larry and Rich Caruso, you know, they're they're old enough to be my father. <laughs> Saying that funny, but um, you know, they they taught me real valuable lessons about work ethic and working real strong and 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 getting results. And and there's people like that in your life who are so, you know, integral that they change the trajectory of your life. And those guys would definitely like that because those guys, you know, uh, gave me a different work ethic and made me focus on getting results no matter what. And there's no excuses and you only have yourself to answer to. So those those type of people are superheroes to me, you know. Shout out to all your superheroes, mentors, and shout out to all the mentors and superheroes out there that's making the change in people's lives out there, especially our youth. So I want right. to make sure I salute these people right now. Any books you're currently reading because I'm always about knowledge and I'm always picking people's brain, especially your brain, because when it comes to your, you know, superb lyricism, I want to know what you be reading about. Uh, I haven't had time to read books in over a decade, man. Okay. Like I, I'll pick up a book, I'll buy books. And then I realize it's just a waste of money. And, and you know, there's certain audio books, but once again, when I'm in the car, I'm on the phone nonstop or I'm listening to a mix or I'm listening to a beat or I'm doing some real estate shit or, you know, I'm talking to a client or I'm talking to a lender or an attorney or somebody or another realtor. Um, I, I just have no time for books anymore and I really miss them. And I hope that one day, you know, when, when I'm able to chill out, I can get back because I used to read a lot when I was younger. And uh, it's just something I don't have the luxury. And at one point in time, you know, uh, my wife had to be like, Stop, stop buying books. You don't even read them. You don't have time. Like, you know, it, it'll, it'll be like, I'll be like, well, I'll read it at night before I go to bed. Nah, man. <laughs> right. <laughs> and maybe I'll lay in bed for two seconds, open it up and be like, ah, I don't, I don't have time for this. And I'll go to sleep. You know, so I, I miss books uh, okay. greatly. Nothing wrong with that. Cause trust me, I got books right by my um, nightstand. I try to, but sometimes I'm just always moving around. So I know how it is. You'd be like, right. damn, like, but. You know, it'll come to when the time to come to. A good question for me to ask you, because I know a lot of people want to know, who is apathy away from the microphone? Um, I, I've thought about that. And, and, and I feel like because it's been so long, um, it, it's, it's, it's tough to, uh, I, I guess it's not tough, though. With the lyrics and the things that I say, a lot of it is fantastical because um you know that that's kind of what i was born into and what i was i was born loving about mcs and lyricists mm -hmm. i love inspected deck and i love cannabis and all those guys who say really crazy far out shit and um 
So that's kind of what I grew up rapping about. So me as a person, um, I, I think right now, nowadays, all my focus goes on, you know, being a father and being the best dad. Um, I'm a guy who, who, who loves history. I, I watch documentaries. Um, I'm in love with, you know, um, uh, period pieces as far as movies go and, and old shows. And, and that's kind of like my calm state. Like when I had a lot of anxiety and depression, I really dug into history studying the 16, 17, 1800s, um, stuff like that, you know, early, early 1900s. And, um, you know, uh, I, I, I love nature. I love being out in it. I love, uh, you know, hiking and walking and all stuff like that. It's that. That was a big thing too, that part of my life, anxiety and panic disorder was such a huge part of my life since I was little, that things like that really helped me and aid me in, in maintaining. So me getting in touch with nature and getting in touch with my sensory experience was really important to me. I've always studied metaphysics and philosophy and esoteric sciences. That's been a huge part of my life. Um, you know, I, I, I fuck with video games. Um, I fuck with Call of Duty probably more than I should. <laughs> I, probably, I should probably be reading, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but it's a point of decompression, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, I'm, I have an obsession with nostalgia, and maybe that comes from, you know, um, me being disenchanted with with the way things are nowadays in society, and me, you know, really reflecting upon and, and appreciating the, the simpler times. And I, I had I had an easy childhood by no means. Um, I had it rough, but something was just magical about the 80s, man. So I'm a big nostalgia buff. I'll spend hours on YouTube, even weird shit, bro. Like I'll look up like, uh, I'll look up like Christmas 1985 and watch kids open presents in 1985 just to see all the shit, you know, that, that we all had, you know what I mean? And then the furniture looked different and everything, yeah. you know what I mean? So, so I, I love nostalgia and, and, you know, Part of that too, um, and, and I hate if I'm going long winded, but I'm I'm just getting into you know me behind the mic. But um, part of that too, part of that nostalgia was for my father. My father passed, um, you know, and my father was my father passed in 2012, and he was probably like the biggest part of my life. You know, um, my biggest influence of all time, my greatest, the greatest man I've ever known. And so uh, even with that, like I say, with nostalgia. Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll spend time where I'll, I'll go drive around Willimantic, Connecticut, where we grew up and I'll play certain records and just drive around looking at things. And that's kind of like the equivalency of my visiting a grave. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that's that's pretty much, you know, who I am and in, in, in a nutshell of, of what I represent. Thank you. I mean, like I said, don't worry about talking. I want you to talk because, like I said, this platform is for you. This is for your the subs, your fans. Everybody want to hear you. They hear me enough what? on reactions already. <laughs> so it's already this is all about you because I'm not one of those people who do who does the interview wants to jump in. No, no disrespect. That's not me. I feel like I give you the platform because it's about you. You put the music out. You on tour. Your other MCs, rappers. It's for the fans, the subs, to be like, wow, let me hear what goes on in their mind away from the record. So that's this is what right. it's about for me. Right, that's dope. Uh -huh. um, this is a funny question, but I have to ask it. All right, so Donald Trump is out of office, finally. <laughs> yep. um, we got a new president, a new vice president. Your thoughts? Um, I'm, I'm so over all of this political shit because, you know, I've, I've been a conspiracy theorist since I was 14 years old. Mm -hmm. And I think that people getting excited that Donald Trump is out of office or that Joe Biden is here or about any president, Democratic or Republican, conservative or liberal. Uh, it, I think at this point with everything that we've seen, it is totally obvious that this is all a fucking charade and it's a facade and it's all bullshit. And, um, we are, pardon me a second, let me get this back. We are, um, 
we're 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 not only fleas on the dog's back talking about the dog we're the microbes on the fleas on the dog's back mm. so for us to sit here and, and stress and act like things are really going to change or this and that is going to happen um it's all bullshit and and all of these things are all distractions to keep us herded and to keep us in check and keep us in order and keep us watching the, the, the fucking, you know, when you, you know, when you want to take a picture of a baby and you hold up something shiny and you're like, look at this shit. That's, <laughs> that's, that's essentially where we're all at. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think that people thinking anything different, that's cool if you believe that and you think that, but, um, I just think that things are totally bullshit nowadays. And I, I've, I've actually, I've actually talked about this so much recently that I've, I've kind of exhausted the thought. And what, what I always say is, you know, if I had a wish, if it was possible, I, I'd love to, like, move to the west coast of Canada uh, up in the fucking boonies where nobody is and just not participate anymore in society the way it is because I don't like the way it's structured. I don't like the way, um, you know, after the George Floyd shit happened, um, that all of a sudden there's all these virtue signaling uh, liberals who are just showing up as as being the the saviors of, of black people uh, because I'm like I, I've I've been I've been tighter with black people for more of my life than with a lot of white people because of the way that I grew up and who I grew up around and who I was with. So where the fuck have y'all been this whole time? Where's your late pass? Um, all these people who I know who went to high school who were fucking rocking out and fucking tripping on acid and listening to Green Day, all of a sudden they're showing up and, and they want to change their fucking Facebook avatar to this and that and come all late to the party and late to the argument. And I'm like, yo, you're so late. You don't even know what the fuck you're really talking about. Mm -hmm. You don't understand. And, and there's still people who argue um, about uh, – they don't understand that they have uh, white privilege by virtue of being white. And you have people who say dumb shit like, well, I don't have white privilege because no one ever gave me anything. That, that's not what the fuck that means. But at any rate, um, all of these motherfuckers are the same. Donald Trump, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris has done way more horrific shit to people yeah. of color than Donald Trump ever had. Donald Trump's a dickhead. I don't like Donald Trump. If anyone is, is friends with me on my personal Facebook, which means you have a connection to me, you've seen me rail against Donald Trump for four fucking years and shit on him and talk shit all the time and make posts about how fucking dumb he is and all this stuff. I don't like Donald Trump. However, um, this is not a solution either. So I'm not going to get pumped or jazz that somebody else is in there or cry because it's a fucking woman. Here's the funny fucking thing, too. Um, you have all these people. I, I, I know so many, uh, you know, white liberal people I see on Facebook and on social media who are like, this is a historic moment. A woman is a vice president. This is incredible. But then they're also like, black lives matter, too, and we want to save our black people. Well, what about Kamala Harris jailing tons and tons of black people and ruining black lives with her jailing for profit and all the things that she did and blocking DNA evidence and blocking evidence that would exonerate innocent men and blocking evidence that would uh, prosecute uh, Catholic priests who were pedophiles. What about all that shit? That shit, none of that matters because she's just a fucking woman and she's in as the, the first lady. I would love a positive role model for my daughter. Like when Star Wars had fucking female superheroes as the lead roles, I was so proud. I teared up because I'm like, finally, my daughter can be the, the main hero and mm -hmm. look at that. But I, I'm not going to get fucking okie doked either and just be like, yo, they, they threw Tim's on Kamala Harris and played Mary J. Blige when she walked out. So I'm totally fucking gassed now. It's, it's all gas. It's all bullshit. And that makes me angry. That makes me upset that people are getting okie doke like that. And I care too much about the black people who are my family and, and who are my friends and my loved ones to ever act like any of this shit is okay or anything's going to fucking change inherently from that particular group of people with Biden and Harris and all of this fuck shit. That's how I feel. Hey, everything you said, I'm 100% I'm with you because I've had 
debates, <laughs> discussions with so many people, you know, and I have my evidence, my, you know, documentation to say what I say, but, you know, it's just sad to see that people would just feel like, oh my God, it's like a relief, but it's like, you still got to put work in for yourself. Like you don't put right. your faith in these people. They're not going to look out for your lives. <laughs> right. We, we, here's the thing. For them at that level, functioning where they are at, they are trying to accomplish a goal and make money. And we are all collateral damage. We are all worker bees. They don't give a backflip flying fuck. I'll let them, and, and everybody says, Give them a chance. See what they're going to do. That's what they said to Donald Trump. Give them, give this person a chance. See what they're going to do. Guess what? Four years is going to go by and not a fucking thing is going to be. And they're all going to do the same corrupt shit. They're all going to bomb villages overseas and kill fucking innocent people who are collateral damage. And they're all going to do all this fucked up shit because that's the way this thing keeps turning. And no one is going to get into office and change that. And if somebody was, they'd be assassinated real early or whatever. So nothing's going to fucking change. Thank you. Thank you so much for saying that. I was listening to Immortal Technique. Um, he was on live on IG the other day. And he was just talking about the same thing you was just talking about. I'm like, thank Like, people with common sense know this. It's like, if you go against the grain, whatever the plan is already, you're not going to let you stay in office. Like, there's a plan before you come in there. Already laid right. out. And you have to be the puppy. Right, right. Absolutely. True, true indeed. Yeah. Um, thank you. That, woo, that was that was good right there. You got me all hyped now. I'm sorry. But um, what do you think about the current state of rap? Man, the, 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 it, it's either like a long answer I can give or I'll try to make it as short as possible. OK. Hip hop in most black art forms are by far the most driving force of popular culture on the planet Earth, okay? Mm -hmm. And, and, and I'm, I'm being very liberal with the idea that I'm also saying that rock was originally created by Black people, which is mm -hmm. true, and that, that makes a driving force too. But when you look at hip-hop and what it has changed and how it has changed the landscape of society and, and the public in general, the masses all over every continent, Hip-hop is a driving force that alters people. It is powerful. With that being said, anything that is that powerful of a tool needs to be harnessed by the people who are in control. Because they're like, why would we not fucking use this to alter things and change things? So I think the level that we're at in what mainstream hip-hop is considered with the materialism and the drugs and all types of shit is by design mm -hmm. and we are exactly where we're at because it is exactly where the higher powers that run whatever the fuck is going on want us to be that's where they want us to be at and that's where they're moving things and uh people are more complacent people are um no pun intended people are apathetic people are materialistic they're consumers of really dumb shit um people are shallow and selfish more so than ever uh driven by the culture that was created through this type of music and i'm not saying the hip-hop culture i'm talking about this new shit whatever the fuck this new shit is because the vibration the vibrational level of it is very low and it's all fucked up um so i think that's where, where that's at and i think that there is just a lot of crazy things going on that is by design, if that answers the question at all. No, that answered the question. Thank you. I mean, I, I definitely want to hear from you. You are OG in the game, and, and especially how you see it and everything that's going on, because you've seen the evolution from when you started, before you even came in to where we at now. And trust me, there is a, you know, the evolution. I always tell people of what has happened to, you know, 2021 is all by design. I tell people that all the time. Right. You know, back in the day, the Bible and what the Bible is, was edited and curated and put into a fashion to be used as a tool to put a steering wheel on society. And there was a, a, a definite move to... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? There was a definite move to control, for lack of a better term, to control people. 
And there was also a lot of movements to spread that word and make sure that word in the Bible was the governing law of most human beings on earth. And that was the powerful thing at the time. And that's still a, a very powerful thing. But popular culture and music are, are the next driving force. And whenever there's a powerful driving force, like I said, you, you know who is going to uh, utilize that and, and grab that steering wheel. Mm, yes, definitely, definitely. You was talking about um, if you went to the West Coast or Canada or some type of like remote island, if you did have a chance to do that and you only can pick 10 albums, which 10 albums you picking and taking with you to listen to you? <laughs> That's first of all, it's a hard question. Second of all, it's such a silly question because we're so immersed in the, the world of playlists. Yeah. And, you know, I, um, let me use my cheat sheet, my cassette set. That's perfect. Little. Use it, use it, yeah. Um, let's see. I'd have to say uh, Illmatic, first of all. Mm -hmm. uh, built for Cuban Link. Okay. I, J. Rue Sunrises in the East. Mm, yes. Organized Confusion Stress, easily. Yes. I mean, that's such an odd. I uh, almost forgot to mention it. Souls of Mischief, 93 Till. Mm. Uh, uh, I got to say Liquid Swords. Woo! I gotta say, Midnight Marauders. Yeah, I was listening to that the other day. <laughs> Diggable Planets Blowout Comb. Okay. Um, I gotta say, Enter the 36 Chambers. Wu is occupying a lot of my list here. <laughs> it's and, mine's too, trust me. <laughs> and then Dark Side of the Moon, Pink Floyd. Okay. Okay, perfect. That's perfect. Thank you. Thank you. I just I, you're not, you're the first person I ever asked that. So I was like, let me just ask him this. Oh. <laughs> um Demigods, AOTP. Love everything about those groups. I mean, AOTP to me, I feel like they're like, if you can have, I mean, I know Wu Tang, they did what they did, but I feel like AOTP is like what Wu Tang is in the underground circuit. I really believe that. And how did you come? of forming with both groups? Like, how did you meet these members? Like, you know, I want to know about that. Well, Demigods, hold on, let me grab this. Demigods uh, was a, a crew around the way uh, from here, from Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And it was a bunch of guys that were from a town that I lived in at the time uh, in like the 90s. It was like 92, 93, I kept hearing about them. And this is when I just started getting serious about trying to rap. Mm -hmm. And I was really influenced by Hyro and, 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 you know, all that bohemian shit. And Hyro was was pretty much my, my biggest influence at the time. And all of a sudden, I started hearing these demos uh, from... If, if you ever seen my Check the Check video, there's, there's a dude who's cooking in the kitchen. His name is JVR Newton, one of my closest friends from back then. And JVR... Um, was friends with this other dude named Voodoo, who's actually in my Peace Connecticut video. <clears throat> and Vu was down with, it was part of the group Demigods with Open Mike and with this dude Steve and this dude Derek. There was four of them. And um, they were actually breaking up around the time where I was trying to join. And and my man Voodoo and Steve were, were, were going to form a separate group. And Open Mike and Derek were were forming their own group. They were staying demigods. And so I called up, I, I got I got open Mike's number from JVR and um or Voodoo. And I called up one day and Mike was with this dude named Etcetera, who's from New York. And Etcetera uh was a dude who was really in the mix in New York as far as being around a whole bunch of industry people. He was a dude who was just a very energetic, very eclectic, very, you know, he had, he had his dreads and shit. And uh, he was part of this crew called Alien Nation with Supernatural. And et cetera answered the phone and was, oh no, no, I'm sorry, that's not what happened. Mike answered the phone. And I was like, hey man, I want to I wanna rap for you. I want to be part of the, your group. And Mike is, Open Mike's one of my best friends in my entire world, probably him himself and my absolute closest friends. But Mike's a dickhead. And Mike's an asshole, and he's really funny. And so 
prior to him knowing me when he got this call from me and I said, yo, I want to rap for you. I want to be part of Demigods. He goes, hold on and handed the phone to et cetera. Like he didn't want to be bothered with it. <laughs> and I like, and et cetera was like, yo, what's up? And so I ended up rapping for et cetera and et cetera told Mike, I heard him like cover the phone. He's like, yo, he's really, really good, man. He's dope. You should fuck with him. So Mike gets back on the phone. He's like, all right, let's, let's do something. So we started um, working and we started doing, let me see if I have it. Uh, we started working on a demo and we did this, this, this song called Feet Don't Fail Me Now. And this was my freshman year of high school mm -hmm. that I had done this. And so we did this, this joint Feet Don't Fail Me Now. It was so fly. It had a really dope sample. Um, it had a Bobby Humphrey sample. It had a, a organized confusion sample for the hook that went, Feet Don't Fail Me Now gotta make it to the studio some way somehow and so we recorded that um and I, I don't know what happened to that that shit never saw the light of day but i'm actually in the process of remaking it here i'll play you what the sample was the loop that we used okay why is that not working Hold on, here we go but uh so we were working on that and and i felt crazy too because at the time I'm freshman year of high school, so I came back and I'm playing all these girls. The demo, I mean, yo, listen, that's my voice on there. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, how dope is this? And uh, it was really ill to have that and to, and to be doing that. And we actually recorded at the college radio station that I uh, was working at. Is this? Oh, my speakers. Here we go. <laughs> You did the beat. Yeah, and then, and then we'll just, here we go. Here's the other part. Don't fail me now. I like that. Fail me now. Beat don't fail me now. Gotta make it to the studio so <laughs> You know what I'm saying? It was dope, man. It was it was it was really ill. And we we had we made a great demo. Then after that, me and Mike, Derek broke off for some reason. And me and Open Mike continued. And we got because we were hanging out with Alien Nation, we were getting on some real cosmic, crazy alien shit, which I had kind of always been on anyway. And we did this song called Galaxy Rays, which is it's available. It's on spotify it's on all all that shit you can look it up on youtube but uh it's it's that's me and open mic we did this song called galaxy rays and um that shit everybody was going crazy around the area like everybody wanted a copy of it on tape everybody was bugging out when we did galaxy rays and uh so we continued to make demos and eventually it led to us doing this tape right here oh, wow. which is a uh i'm trying to get it without the glare but uh, that's me and open mic, and you know it's ill. We had them, we had them officially made up, man. Like these were a real deal. Demi guys, ones we we pressed them up and all that shit. Wow. And uh, yeah, it was funny, man. We fucking. But uh, we recorded we recorded this demo with Al T McLaren in New York, and, and Al T Al T used to be part of Jam On Production. Well, he still is. He tours with them and everything. But they did Jam On It, a Jam On It. So working with Al was was crazy. But we just continued to do the Demigods thing, man. And so that's how kind of Demigods was born. And then after a while, Mike got real busy with life and, you know, having a wife and kids earlier than me. So um, I uh, kind of took the reins with Demigods and, and I, I changed its form a couple of times trying to fine tune it until, you know, me and Self-Titled met um, in the late 90s. And um, that's when it really started popping off uh, as far as putting out independent music. And then Army of the Pharaohs, you know, I met Vinny. Um, God, I, I think I met Vinny in 96. Wow. And uh, yeah, me and Vinny met in 96. Uh, started recording in 97. Because I got their Amber Pro BP. So maybe it was, maybe it was, I don't remember if it was 96 or 97. I got their Amber Pro BP. And I never heard nobody rapping about the same shit I was rapping about with Elohim and all that and all the sciences. And uh, so I emailed them, the email, the fucking, the email that was on the label of the vinyl. And we started talking and I went and recorded for the first Jedi Mind Tricks album. I was on three songs on there. 
And uh, it was really dope, man. It was a really dope time. And then later on, Paz was like, yo, listen, let's form a group. It's going to be called uh, the Tibetan Black Magicians. And it's going to be me, you, Bahamadia, Virtuoso. I think it was Esoteric. And um, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then when Self and I got really busy doing uh, our records, I just kind of, it, it, it just kind of didn't happen. So then Paz put out the first Army of the Pharaohs thing, but originally that was called Tibetan Black Magicians. And um, so then after a few years later, after Violent by Design, he was he hit me up, he hit up self and was like, yo, I'm doing this super group. Let's, let's all do it, Army of the Pharaohs. And uh, as a big group. So then we just started rocking and started doing it. And but Paz has always been... He's always picked all the beats. Uh, well, that, that that's not totally true. He would, Paz orchestrated it, and he'd get like 40, 50, 100 beats, send them out to everybody's emails, and we would all, we'd either try to start something up, like he'd be like, you know, I, I'd take a beat and just start it up, throw a hook on it, throw a verse on it. And if it came to fruition, it did. If it didn't, you know, it didn't. So sometimes there were joints that just didn't happen, you know, or somebody else would start up a joint and it didn't happen. But most of the time we would just, it kind of just came together. Or there was just joints where Paz totally would just be like, yo, this is the one. Everybody drop eight bars, drop a 16, whatever. Mm -hmm. Wow. Dang, history. Thank you. I love it. I love hearing about this, man. This makes me feel so Word. good because, you know, just sometimes, you know, we enjoy just listening to the music, but we never know the backstory. We never know how everything right. came together because, you know, the piece that tastes good, but nobody doesn't know how the, the chef is in the um, kitchen prepping the right. dough, putting the um, sauce down, the mozzarella cheese and everything. <laughs> right. right, exactly. Yeah. Um, another question I have, this is a funny question. If you're into Marvel, because I'm a big Marvel fan, um, if you can compare yourself to any Marvel character, I asked Self and Black and Stan this question, who would you compare yourself to and why? Mm. Um, fuck, man. I'm trying to think of, like, a really good one. Um, man, I hate to be cliche about it, but, uh, I feel like Wolverine, but there's a reason. And there's a reason because I just feel, I feel old and irritated and jaded, <laughs> and annoyed, and, like, I just keep going on forever and I got an adamantium skeleton, you know, adamantium skeleton. And uh, I, I, I relate to Wolverine for so He just seems so fucking over it and so annoyed. And, and that's how I feel. I, I hate to say that. And I wish I had, you know, like a, a better, cooler thing. But when, I've, been, I've been into Wolverine for a long time, since the early 80s. Yes. And that's when not a lot of people were up on X-Men. Mm -hmm. It was different. It was very, very different. I was, in, I was big into the new mutants who had an offshoot called the fallen angels. I got all those right in my closet. I got all the old new mutants, the old uncanny X-Men. Mm -hmm. So I, I was real big into that back then. I got like literally hanging on, hanging on my fucking wall here. Can I switch it? Oh, wow. Yeah. Number one of Wolverine with his spinoff. I had I bought that when it first came out in this place called National Drug. It was like a drugstore, mm -hmm. um, but that yeah that was my uh, that was my shit, man. So Wolverine is you know, and I, I used to have this. I had this babysitter named Dave, um, and Dave was a big comic book head. And they, they man, Dave Dave was a shit because Dave was he was still a teenager when he was babysitting me. But, you know, it's basically just somebody to watch. Because I was already, well, I, I don't know how fucking old I was, like six or seven. But, you know, I, I, when my mom worked, I had to have somewhere to be. So I would be at Dave's house. Um, and uh, Dave had the fucking Nintendo. We would we would chill. like And, and uh, one of my friends, Mike, was his cousin. So, you know, I, I would hang out with Mike and Dave. And, and Dave was really into comic books and could draw. And that's who put me on to to the real shit. Mm -hmm. So I was like six or seven and I got put onto the, you know, Excalibur and like I said, New Mutants and all of those joints, even like rare shit like Elf Quest, 
all of these comic book titles that were really obscure. Um, Dave will put me on to all these titles. And um, so, so that's why I, I really felt Wolverine since back then. He's always been my favorite. Okay. Yeah. I love Wolverine. He's one of my, he's in my top five favorite um, Marvel characters. So shout out to Logan. That's what I'm talking about. I, I, <laughs> good looking, good looking. Um, this is this is this question is for like upcoming artists, and I know they're probably gonna listen to you because they love your music already, or probably just coming around knowing who you are. Do you feel um an upcoming artist should they stay or should they try to go the indie route or should they try to sign to a major label? They can try to to go the major route too. Um, they can also try to play Powerball every day. It doesn't mean anything's gonna happen. Um, but if you come up with a solid business plan and you work really hard independently, you're going to be tapped into far more consumers and you're going to be tapped into people who um, will support, actually support and, and you know, um, get behind your music and, and care about who you are and follow your catalog because that's where that type of person is. Um, and you can spend years and years and years and years of your life trying to pop off on a major and it can never happen. You could spend years and years and years of your life trying to get into a major and you get there and you get a fucked up deal or you don't make as much money or you sit and get shelved or something. All of these things can happen. So to make your game plan essentially winning the lottery makes no fucking sense at all. None. So it, it's if it happens for you, awesome. That's great. Dope. And you're lucky. And, and luck is everything. It's not about skill. It's not about resilience. Because I know some people who are fucking incredibly skilled, even on a commercial level, that I don't even fuck with that kind of music, but I know they're skilled. Pop writers who have the craziest work ethic and they'll sleep in their fucking cars and work 47 hours a day and fucking go crazy. But it still doesn't happen for them. So it's not just about perseverance and hard work and shit like that. It's luck, bro. It's straight up luck because then there's tons of people who fucking suck and they're terrible and mediocre and average and they blow the fuck up and the machine gets behind them. So my point is, is that it's, it's usually better to start out at least indie and work really, really hard and master this business, you know? Thank, thank you for um, telling us that because that, that means a lot. I mean, especially because, you know, sometimes you have people that feel like, dang, I never got my chance. But I always try to tell people that did not define you just because mm -hmm. you didn't make it into music or you didn't go to the NFL, the NBA. You still have a journey out here. Don't don't look at that as a downfall. Right. Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right. And exactly. Because you can be the best lyricist, best rapper in the world, but if you're broke afterwards, now what? Like, you still right. got to have a plan afterwards. Right, right, absolutely. That's definite. And I don't think enough people think in those terms. And um, it's important for people to have a contingency. Correct, correct. I only got a couple of questions left. Um, one question I want to ask for the fans you have any upcoming projects or features we should know about this year? Yeah, definitely. Um, I have an album that's coming out called Where the River Meets the Sea. I have two albums coming out this year. Okay. I have Where the River Meets the Sea, and that's very introspective. It's a lot about my father passing. Uh, it's about my kids being born, uh, raising my kids. Um, it's about me almost dying from pancreatitis. Oh, then when I lot about it i mean there's there's different songs that touch upon that but they all feel different and it's done in a dope way it's not just like me crying about shit like i i do it in an ill way where the songs are are done properly and um and and that's not the whole album i got shit talking joints on there too i got a joint <laughs> called around i got a joint called public school era with styles p and with little fame on it Woo! And crazy it's definitely a single um, I got a joint on there called Underwater with my man Chris Webby and Annoyed. Um, I have uh, and my homegirl Brevy on the hook. Uh, I got my homegirl Bennett, who's signed to Atlantic Records. She sings two joints on there. I got my brother Snack the Ripper on there. Um, yes. I got it. 
it's a really, really, really dope album. And it means a lot to me, man. There's, there's records on there that I've just, I, it, it's, it's definitely a masterpiece that I've crafted that I'm the most proud of. And then after that is going to be a big fan pleaser is going to be me and Stu Banger's album together. Okay. And that, it's an album that's, that's, that's themed. I was going to call us a group, but it's more like a loose title. Like, you know how Stu and Ill Bill are Cannibal Hulk, but that's not the group. Uh, yeah. My shit is Amin Ra, and the title of the album is, is um, King of Gods, No Second. Uh, meaning there's none, none other, you know, that's that's the term that they use for Amon Ra, King of Gods, no second to Amon Ra. And um, so that's what it is. I got Jada Kiss on there. I got Black Thought. Yep, J Thought. Black Thought did like 32 bars. He blacked out, bro. And Jada Kiss gave me an A-list, A-list verse. I didn't know what to expect, what they were going to send me. Black Thought sent me back his verse. I'm listening. I'm like, oh shit and then he keeps going and i'm like oh shit he's still going yeah, yo he just went in and the record is so fucking incredible man um i got black thought on there black like i said um uh the jada kiss song is incredible the hook all the, they're really good songs too it's not just a feature for a feature's sake i carefully picked what what beat and what everything i was gonna do um i got esoteric on there we do something that sounds like real Real classic, like indie, indie hardcore shit. Mm -hmm. uh, self titles, obviously gonna be on there. Yes. Um, I got my man R.J. Payne on there. Ah. Oops, okay. low battery warning there. Love um, R.J. Payne. Woo, love yeah, R.J. Payne. Beast it out on there, man. It, it's incredible. That the, the album's nuts, though, man. It, it's it's really dope. I'm still finishing up a couple of tracks, so I got a couple people to add. But uh, I got I got quite a few solo joints on there um i got sick jacket on there um, okay it, it it's dope man it's the album's so fucking hard and so incredible it's really really crazy okay um when can we expect the first album to be released we're about to hand in uh the breakdowns of the for the vinyls and the cassettes meaning how the tracks are going to be broken down so we're going to be pressing up the vinyl soon which means that i don't like to do releases unless at least the vinyl is starting to be in the works you know what i'm saying okay so, um uh, it's definitely going to be sometime in the first half of the year, and then the second album is going to be in the second half of the year. I know that's vague, but we're trying as hard as we can. I just don't want to, you know, overpromise and underdeliver. You know, I I'd rather, uh, you know, be realistic about it. No, that's fine. Um, I'll, of course, I'm going to be in contact with you whenever your first single video comes out. I will react to it on my channel to so, get that promotion for you. I will do mm -hmm. album reviews. For both yeah. projects, don't worry about that. I'm gonna make sure I bless you about that, man. Well, I'm gonna get you. I'm gonna get you copies early. You know, just just keep them guarded with your life. You oh know yeah, trust me. I promise. I want to digest it. I want you to be able to digest it and not feel rushed to do the review. So okay. I'll give you advanced copies of the albums, and so okay. that way you can hear them and have some time with them to really digest them. You know what I mean? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And um, one of the last questions is right here. I know you heard this. This is cliche. Your top 10 rappers. <laughs> Here's the interesting thing that I realized. Um, I realized that it changes. Every couple years, I, I change. But, uh, you know, because some people come off and some people go on. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I mean, the, the, the mainstays is Nas. You know, Nas was a huge influence on me, but my number one all-time influence in, in the, that's the thing, that's the difference is the top 10, but some of those guys are my biggest influences too. But my number one biggest influence is Feral March, like mm. for certain. Um, so Nas, Feral March, Jay-Z, um, Chuck D, Ice Cube, um, Definitely uh, pun. So that's six. Um, I want to say Big L. I want to say um, who else? I'm like overthinking this right now. Guru. Yeah. Um, yep. 
and I want to say who else? I'm like holding on to something. I, I know that KRS and did I say Ice Cube already? Ice Cube. Mm -hmm. Did I already said Ice Cube? Yes. Okay. Uh, Brother J from X Clan. Oh yeah, yeah. Brother J from X Clan. Okay, for sure, for sure, for sure. Um, one of the final things, you know, is this is your time. Anything you want to say to your fans, the subs on my channel, the people for the first time coming to my channel and the people the first time maybe even hearing about who you are. This is your right. time to say whatever you want to say. I just want to say that uh, I appreciate everybody who really loves and keeps hip hop dear to their heart. It's like my religion. I love it. I'm obsessed with it. Um, and it makes it makes me really happy that people are carrying on the tradition and people are showing love. And uh, I also want to say that to everybody with these times that we're going through, um, turn off your TVs, get off your phones, go walk through nature if you can, go take a walk, go go have a sensory experience, you know what I'm saying? Go hike and fucking scrape your knee or something. Live as a human life because they keep taking it away from us more and more. We keep getting more and more connected to the matrix and spending the hours of our lives um, doing something that's not real. Um, you know, hang out and have fun. Don't stress shit. Don't worry about people online. Don't worry about online, all that. Um, have a good life and uh, be fucking nice to people, man. I'm trying more and more to be more genuine every day, to be nice to people um, and to do good things. Because when we talk about all the change that we want, I think those are the things that are going to matter the most. And, you know, my father, when, when my father was alive, if it was almost like a cliche, if somebody was broken down on the side of the road, he'd pull over and try to help him change a tire or some shit. And uh, I, I think I'm just striving to be, especially now that I'm a father, I'm just striving to be like my dad was, you know, and, and be a better person. And I think that's what everybody should kind of focus on, especially now, like double down on it. You know, and just do good. I think that's it. Thank you. Uh, I'm definitely going to take that advice. I appreciate that. I know it ain't just for me only, but no, thank you for saying that. Um, where can everyone follow you on social media? Can you give out your social media platforms and um, yeah, your websites? Just at, right on Instagram, it's just at apathy, and on uh, Twitter, it's at apathy DGZ. I'm not on Twitter as much. I'm on Instagram the most. If anybody wants to holler or check me out, um, I, I, I'm on the Clubhouse app, which is really dope. That's at apathy DGZ. Um, yeah, that's really it, man. Facebook is apathy. If you could find me on there, uh, that's it. Okay, there you have it, y'all. Apathy came through, bless us, bless the channel. Until next time, y'all. Salute.